From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudy Mudder, and this matters. Hi, Toronto Star listeners. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? I would like to know what your name is because I don't know anyone's name. What's it like being on March break with everything closed and with Mummy and Daddy both working from home? Boring. I want to go rock climbing, sir. And you also miss school, right? Yes. Why are you missing school? Because I would like to see my friends, which I can't, which is boring. For the kids, it's been a really long March break. We are all living through a very stressful time. And many millennials and Gen Xers are sandwiched between caring for their kids and watching out for their parents, who are at higher risk to this disease that has turned our world upside down. I don't have to welcome all of you to the sandwich generation squeeze, as many Canadians have been living with it for a long time. But in the time of COVID-19, the pressure on those stuck in the middle is tougher than ever. The sandwich generation is a fun-sounding term that often isn't much fun at all. It's the name given to people who have to juggle worrying about the needs of aging parents and young children. And has become a huge issue during this COVID-19 pandemic, where we have to self-isolate and take extra precautions around our loved ones. Everyone's situation is different, but one thing that's been interesting is how many young people feel they've had to parent their parents, who may not have been taking this seriously enough. To discuss these issues, we've gotten in touch with Dr. Nathan Stahl, a physician who specializes in internal medicine and geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, and is a research fellow at Women's College Research Institute and the University of Toronto. Thank you so much for being with us. Great, thanks so much for having me, Dr. Stahl. I'm someone who is part of the sandwich generation. I have a young kid and elderly parents who've had a number of health emergencies, and that can be stressful on the best of days. But in this COVID-19 pandemic, this has to be taken to the next level. First off, let's talk about the scope of this. I believe statistics have this at one in four Canadians sort of are feeling this sandwich generation squeeze, which would make it a huge issue. Are you part of the sandwich generation? So I'm uh, a little bit younger to miss the huge bulge of the sandwich generation. I do have two young kids at home. Fortunately, my parents uh, don't yet require uh, caregiving. But you know, some of my peers who are my age certainly are experiencing this, or or my generation. So yes, this is something we're acutely aware of, and you're absolutely right that in the time of this pandemic, the strains are being completely exacerbated. You know, this is one of these things where, from my perspective, you know, my parents used to be built in babysitting, but now with the kids off on this sort of extended March break, you know, they want to see my daughter more, but they're the ones are at high risk. So right now I'm trying to keep our distance. I also think one of the other really, really big things right now is, is even for millennials, a lot of people are feeling like they have to parent their parents. Are you hearing that? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, you're, you've scratched at a lot of things here that I think are really, really important. So, you know, this, the sandwich generation, just for our listeners, uh, so these are the the individuals in society who are facing the dual dualities of sort of caring for their aging parents and their own children. And as you've highlighted, when because of the necessary closures of schools and child care centers across the country to help us maintain social distancing, and we're also seeing that we're asking older adults and asking people to you know, maintain as much distance from older adults. We're facing these sort of dual pressures of increasing childcare, needing to be there for older adults, but having them at a greater distance. And this is all making it a very extreme pressure for people in the sandwich generation. The other thing that I'll, I'll say on this uh, is that even before all of COVID-19 emerged, um, more than a third of our entire Canadian workforce were already balancing their job responsibilities with the caregiving they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm not talking about child caregiving. That, that's an addition, but I'm talking about the what we would call family caregiving, so providing care to individuals who have a long-term health condition or disability. And so already a third of these people were working and balancing these responsibilities. Now we're in a period of time where, A, we're being asked to work from home, but our kids are at home, uh, so there's the increased burden of that. 
Um, and when you think specifically about caregiving, you know, the government has acted to try and protect workers. So, for example, the federal government has waived the one-week waiting period for the employment insurance for people who are in quarantine or self-isolated. But that actually doesn't talk about the caregivers who might actually be having to look after the sick COVID-19 patients. And then the Ford government introduced legislation to provide job-protected leave um, for workers in quarantine or isolation. They did extend this to people who need to be away from work for child care. But again, the frontline caregivers who are going to be providing a lot of the care for COVID-19 are sort of left out of this as well. So we're facing this unique time, particularly for the sandwich generation of increasing pressure to look after their kids, increasing anxiety and, and the need to be there from parents, but we're asked to be distanced from them, and then tremendous financial and job-related pressure. So it really is a, a really unique and difficult time for people. Dr. Stahl, one of the terms that I read in some of the research you did is the term informal caregivers. What does that mean and who are they? Yeah, so actually informal caregivers is a term we're actually largely starting to abandon, and I think for good reason. It was the term that was historically used in the literature starting in the 1980s to refer to the fact that most caregivers at that time were mostly being relied on for sort of emotional support, basic assistance with household tasks, and personal care. And what we know now in 2020 is that even outside of this COVID-19 pandemic, many caregivers are actually performing really complicated medical and nursing tasks. So we're, and this will not be a surprise to family caregivers, but they're providing things like managing people's medications. Uh, they're, they're doing things like wound care at home. They might be operating medical devices like uh, glucometers to check individuals' blood sugars. And some are even operating medical equipment like oxygen therapy and ventilators. And, you know, as we think about COVID-19 being a respiratory infection, there might be an even greater need for caregivers to, to perform these kind of tasks. So when we talk about caregiving, we actually say it's actually no longer informal. So we use the term, and I, I, among others, use the term family and friend caregivers because caregivers will tell you, well, the work I'm doing today is so complex, it's so intense, that there's nothing informal about it. One of the things that we have to talk about is that these family caregivers, the majority of these are women. And how does this impact them more? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So the, the majority of caregivers are women. And not only that, when we look at the the amount of time that's spent caregiving, women tend to spend much more time caregiving than men do. So when we just talk about the proportion, it's a, you know the split is actually not as big as one would think in Canada. It's about close to 60% women who are caregivers compared to 40% men. But then when you look at the hours that people put in on a weekly basis, women are much likely to be providing more hours. And the other thing related to that is women are most much more likely to be involved in sort of much more personal care. So whether that's helping with toileting, dressing, or bathing. And actually, that's particularly relevant in a time of a pandemic because when you have close contact with an individual like that, and we've seen this actually in the Ebola health emergency that happened a couple of years ago, women are actually more likely to get infected with the virus because of the close contact they have related to their caregiving responsibilities. So yes, already women were, were the ones who were assuming much you know, much of the sort of family caregiving roles. But in a time of a pandemic, there are you know, a lot of extra considerations about how this can have a greater impact on women and the men. And again, one of them being that they're more likely to be infected. But there are many other considerations related to that, particularly with respect to this discussion. So we already know that when it comes to child care responsibilities, you know, we've made, you know, I would argue modest gains over the last sort of half century in terms of sharing child caring responsibilities. But we still know when a child is sick, women are about 10 times more likely than men to remain home with, from work with a sick child. And they're much more likely to be the ones who are involved in sort of the medical care or planning the activities of the children than men are. And, and you know, that, that, that's not to say that there are not many fathers or men who who are deeply involved in that or not other other relationships that might involve two fathers or, or, or two mothers. But we do know from overall is that women do tend to be more involved in that way. And so when you're talking about a situation like this where you've, you know, the child care that we rely on has, has largely evaporated, appropriately so, and we're talking about all the financial and other pressures I've discussed, this is going to fall on women, we think, much more than men. I think one of the other huge issues is that approximately, I think, 500,000 people in Canada live with dementia. Uh, what additional challenges could occur now? I mean, beyond, obviously, a sense of paranoia that I think we're all living with right now. Yeah, so um, what's really, and I'm a geriatrician, so what's really, really um, 
uh, troubling and, and hard to see in this is uh, the impact this is, is having already on, on older adults. So we know from data that's, that's mostly come out of China, but is being uh, sort of corroborated uh, from the European experience as well, is that older adults, so everyone can get infected with coronavirus or COVID-19, but Older adults are the ones that tend to have more severe infections, uh, needing hospitalization, and they're also, unfortunately, the ones who are more likely to die. So the experience from China showed that about 10% of people over the age of 70, and when you looked over the age of 80, uh, it was about 15% of all individuals who had uh, COVID-19 actually died as a result of the infection. So because of that, what we're asking uh, so we're asking everyone to uh, practice social distancing to protect those most vulnerable, which older adults are one of them, but all, we know that there are other immunocompromised individuals that also need to be protected. Uh, and, and when we're asking for everyone to do this, there are impacts particularly on older adults, and you've highlighted the case of dementia, which are even more sort of frail and older adults who may have other medical conditions. And so many people with dementia also live in, in nursing homes, and some of them in retirement homes as well. And, and you'll note that we've generally across the country restricted access to retirement homes and long-term care facilities. So what you're seeing here are, are two things. One is that um, we already know that older adults, and particularly people who have dementia, are socially isolated. They have high rates of loneliness, and now we're further distancing them. And that's appropriate. I'm not suggesting we should do otherwise. But I would argue we, ne we haven't necessarily made all the means available to maintain socialization and, and help these individuals have that sense of connection that they need. And the other challenging thing, and we're seeing this um, being covered uh, in the media as well, is that this is so difficult for the caregivers as well. So they're, they know how important their presence is for older adults, how, how important their presence is to support people with dementia. And for many of the care facilities, for example, the, the Lynn Valley Care Center uh, in British Columbia that had, unfortunately, the first coronavirus or COVID-19 death and had an outbreak in the care facility, people are isolated to their rooms for 14 days. And you can imagine someone who's already socially isolated and lonely, someone who has cognitive impairment and is now being confined to a room. This is a really, really challenging time. What type of stories and questions are you hearing from your patients and their families? You know, I think we're at a time now, and, 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 and I keep, you know, I read uh, something from uh, a reporter in Italy that whatever life was like three days ago is unrecognizable today. Um, so the pace at which, at which this is changing is just remarkable. So I, I think right now, you know, we have not seen the level of hospital admissions and deaths that we're, we've seen in other jurisdictions like Italy. And we're hoping and, and just really trying to urge everyone that if we practice social distancing, we can flatten the curve as we speak to sort of stretch out the, the transmission of, of this virus so that it doesn't totally overwhelm our healthcare system. So right now, as I talk to you, we're at a state, and I think everyone can appreciate this, that where everyone's just really scared and fearful and there's a ton of misinformation and there's information overload and even with correct information it's coming at us so fast and changing so quickly that people are so 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 scared and you know it's just even getting questions from patients and their caregivers and their families practical questions about what can I cannot do? What should I be cleaning? I've traveled here. What do I need to do? How do I get my parents who are snowbirds out of the country? When should they come home? I mean, people are really, really scared. It's a time of uncertainty. And we're seeing the data and the stories coming out of places like Italy. And, you know, it's really, really, really scary. We're also seeing stories of just you know, stories that have made the news about panic buying and snatching up all the supplies. And, you know, if you're a frail older adult or you're a caregiver who has kids at home and you're looking after a frail older adult at home, you might not have the one or two or three hours it takes to venture out into the crowd to collect all those supplies, right? Um, and so I think thankfully now there was sort of an initial panic, but I think some of this has calmed down. But we're seeing kindness emerge, which I think is going to be essential during this time. We're seeing people stepping up. We're seeing sort of, I think, what makes what makes us amazing as Canadians, which is people are really uh, digging deep into their community. One of the things I noticed this morning was a movement um, which I thought was quite relevant to this conversation today, which was started actually by uh, some 
there's uh, just some Facebook groups in communities in Ottawa, Halifax, and Nova Scotia that have about 30,000 members between them. And what they asked us all to do is to promote what they called caremongering, so C-A-R-E-M-O-N-G-E-R-I-N-G, caremongering as opposed to scaremongering. And I thought that was quite nice. So actually, that uh, I'm noticing that has been uh, trending across Twitter, which is how can we come together, how can we, uh, you know, seek out acts of kindness and, and be better to one another so that we all have enough supplies that we can help those who aren't able to venture out or are too scared to venture out or who are too vulnerable to, to venture out to get the supplies. The other thing I noticed as well today was that um, – Another movement that's a sort of emerged um, is major grocery chains and pharmacies now opening up the first hour of their store to older adults and people who are immunocompromised to allow them to shop in a clean store and away from other individuals. Uh, and so ha- some hashtags have sort of started to trend related to that, such as uh, Senior Shop First. So I, I noted that Shoppers Drug Mart is now doing that, and they're offering, I think, the seniors discount they normally apply during that hour. Uh, like it's a weekly discount, but they're applying it during that hour to older adults who 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 may choose to shop at that time. So I, I think we're, it's active kindness and coming together that are really going to help overcome that widespread fear and that widespread sort of uncertainty in this time. I was going to ask about misinformation, and you, you touched upon it a little bit. I'd like to expand on that, but the other thing is, is, what are the other things that you are concerned about right now? I mean, I think that misinformation is a really big one, and, you know, not to out my dad, but he keeps sending, you know, all these quote-unquote funny memes on like the family WhatsApp and you're like, are you taking this seriously or not? (laughs) So, yeah. uh, um, Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about sort of the misinformation and disinformation out there and how do we, how do we fight that? Yeah. So I, uh, absolutely. It's rampant. Um, What, you know, we, we, you have to come back to what are the the sources of information that we know are verified and that we are, are coming from, government and public health uh, official sources. So, you know, we have the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, They have been quite active in Ontario here. We have the Public Health Agency of Ontario. We have Toronto Public Health. Uh, These individuals are putting out a lot of information, and some of them are also active on social media as well, which is where I would argue a lot more people of my generation, sort of millennials and Gen Xers, are accessing a lot of their information related to the the COVID-19 outbreak. The other thing is, I mean, which is, uh, as you know, as a reporter is essential sometimes in times like this is people being able to report themselves from the front line outside of traditional media. And we're seeing that from some of the physicians in in Italy, uh, which I think have been very informative, particularly within my professional circles of changing sort of how furious. I mean, it's not that we weren't taking it seriously, but just the overwhelming level of demand this is placed on their health and critical care system and the unique challenges that they're facing when they're overrun and, and may not have enough ventilators for patients, may not have enough critical care beds. But I but I think, you know, we, I think people are generally hyper aware already of, you know, quote unquote, fake news and the, the potential for dissemination of false information in this setting. So I think people already are aware of that and, and have a heightened level, but, but there's certainly is the you know the challenge of this being amplified even by people who are, are well intentioned there was a, a thread on twitter from uh, someone who was claiming to report about the Seattle experience. And then he had posted the Seattle experience of what he thought the intensive care physicians clinical experience had been like with COVID-19. It was quite dramatic and quite concerning to me and my colleagues, and particularly my intensive care colleagues. And it came out after that he actually had to take it down. And he said, I've been told by many individuals, this doesn't reflect the day-to-day experience, that it's, it, it's more dramatic than it actually was. So you know, what I would tell Canadians is, um, you know, I, I think there's something for a family group chat or a friend group chat. It's a way of keeping together and, and not being too distanced in this time when we are being physically distanced. But it's more of that one, let's rely on uh, information that's verified and coming from known sources. And two, it's like, how can we shift to more of this and I touched on this before, care mongering rather than scare mongering, right? And I think that's also important to remember right now. Going back to that sandwich generation, for people who are feeling the squeeze, what advice do you have? Uh, So, you know, one is that I think our governments can do more to protect people who are caregiving and particularly sandwich generation caregivers. So I spoke about the absence of sort of paid job protected leave. I understand, I'm not uh, naive that this is an incredibly hard economic time for Canadians and Canadian businesses across the country. 
But I also think this is a time to do remarkable things. And if it's not legislating paid caregiving leave, perhaps Canadian employers, the ones that can, can step up and sort of provide as much paid caregiving leave as possible. I don't know whether there's opportunities to extend the employment insurance to people who are assuming caregiving roles as opposed to those in quarantine or self-isolation. So I think there's advocacy work there and just putting yourself in, in the shoes of some of these individuals, young kids at their home, now they're they're not able to to work the job they were able to do. They're as you talked about managing the dual competing demands of managing expectations, fears, providing care for their older parents. This is a time for Canadian employers who are able to do so to step up and try and provide paid caregiving leave. And then again, coming back to community, right? We are Canadian. I've seen it in my neighborhood. I've seen it across the city and I've seen it across the country where people are coming together to try as best as they can to support people who know that this is a really, really uh, challenging time. So, for example, in my professional circles in in medicine, what we've seen actually is that uh, the medical students, in, in light of all this, have actually been dismissed at the University of Toronto and at other medical schools across the country from clinical duty. And so these are people who are very close to the end of their, you know, to being to becoming doctors. Um, they're motivated, bright people, and they're finding all sorts of amazing ways to try and support the medical and scientific community and the healthcare practitioner community. So what the students at the University of Toronto and and I know that Western University have done and, and other universities across the country in their medical schools is that the medical students have organized to provide unpaid child care for health for frontline healthcare workers during this time. So that's a prime example of, uh, you know, how people can repurpose, redeploy, uh, and step up to, to help those on the front lines. And I think there's a role to do that for the sandwich generation as well that we know are feeling this dual squeeze. Dr. Schultz has been really amazing for us. Is there anything else that you think that we should know? Um, you know, the one thing that, that I would say uh, about caregivers in general, and I think this will apply to family caregivers, um, is that, and, and not to end on a, on a negative note, but we already know when it comes back to the fact that many caregivers are now performing these medical and nursing tasks. So we know that most people don't actually have training related to the roles that they're doing. So public health actually released guidelines last week for how to care for a person with COVID-19 at home. And a lot of that was related to the infection control precautions that one would take to minimize risk of transmission. But I think we're going to need to start to think, particularly as our healthcare system is predicted to get overwhelmed with critically ill patients, is how can we enable and support people to look after the more chronic conditions in the community and, and in their homes even so. And so that might be, uh, can we deliver virtual training to them? Can we deliver uh, virtual support to them? What equipment needs are they going to need during this time, right? And particularly for the sandwich generation who who may be needing to absorb some of the care of their older parents who who may not have been in a a residential care facility like a nursing home or a retirement home. There's a a role here as well to empower every Canadian to be able to, and uh, to train them to look after some of the, the medical conditions we might have to over the next coming weeks and months. Dr. Salt, thank you so much for your time today. Great. Thanks so much for having me to talk about this important topic. That was Dr. Nathan Stahl, who is a physician who practices internal medicine and is a geriatrician at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. He's also a research fellow at Women's College Institute and the University of Toronto. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajin Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etesas. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.